Hello, my name is Wojtek Fus and I'm a concept artist for film and video games. Today, I would like to take you through the process of creating this key art. Welcome to chapter three, assembling. Now it's the time to bring it all together, to take all the elements that we created in the previous chapter, combine them and put them all into one 3D package. So you will see me doing a 3D block out, shade, introduce some prop, light it, use VFX in order to come up with a final render. So let's get started. Now I have all of the assets I need to create my illustration is that they all spread out, right? I set, I created a character in DAZ. I created my car destruction in Blender. I have my Kitbash set from Photobash with the city ready. And I have Megascans assets on my disposal to populate the scene with details that I need. So again, my character, right? My Kitbash set. Destroyed cars. So all of these puzzles and then, of course, uh, Megascans. So all of these, right now, I want to combine into one scene and I have, I want to have all of these building blocks in one ecosystem, in one software, so that I can actually just place the camera and start composing this shot according to my sketch. And a lot of the stuff might change, like the lighting, I'm not sure of, um, the lighting on the car and the exact composition of the elements might change. So this is just my, an organic approach to illustration that it gives me enough to move on, but it still leaves me an opportunity to be creative in the later stages. So let's dive in, uh, let's try to assemble all of the elements into one Cinema 4D file. And I'll be working within that Kitbash file entirely since majority of the assets are already set up with the materials here. So let's move on. Also, a quick note, I will be exporting my DAS model into Cinema, and I probably won't be using any materials on that. The reason is it just looks great within the iRay renderer here. So what I will do, and you will see me do that in the fourth part of this tutorial when rendering, it will be having a placeholder in Cinema 4D and rendering the same pose, the same camera angle for the character inside DAS and then composing it into my PSD file. All right, so it will be easier to see once I'm doing it. So let's move on. So now I'm ready to start compositing my shot with all of the elements already loaded in here. There are a couple of things I want to go through here. I uh, would maybe delete this cam default camera, delete human scale, um, rename that into a character. Uh, I have new cars, destroyed cars, a floor plane, a light source, and that will do. What we will need right now is to look at the sketch uh, I made, which is still as ugly as it was, super doodly, but uh, that's good because right now with all the building blocks I have at my disposal um, that I loaded into that scene, we can start defining and making that scene a little bit more real. So what I will try to do is load that image into my camera view. Uh, try to find an angle and start placing elements in the shot so that I'm composing my shot around 
that area. I don't have to create the whole city. I can fake a lot of stuff uh, since my only goal is to make it look good in that shop. Well, uh, to do that, we need to create new camera, then create a new background object here, create the default material, and then load my sketch into that, into the color. All right, here it's loaded. So now if I define that material, you can see it pops into my viewport here, right? It's not exactly what we need, but what we have to do first is maybe get those proportions into my render view. So that is 2184 to 1000. And let's lock that ratio. So now we will be able to see that. Yes, this done properly. Um, but my sketch fits into the camera view. Also, if I go into the render view, let's refresh. In my Octane window, you will be able to see the bars that are defining the area of my shop. So, see those gray bars, right? What I like to do is just to cut it the way my shot is composed. In order to see that, that pass through in my Octane window, what I have to do is enable alpha channel and then I can somewhat see it if I turn off the floor. All right, so this will be enough for me to, to place these objects here. And I, if I want to turn it off, I'll just double click here so it doesn't appear in the viewport. What I also find distracting, let's turn it off for now. What I also find quite distracting at this stage of work is all of these materials that I have here because they're not yet properly set up and I don't want to worry about them. So you can see my character having no textures, as I said, as I will be just using it as a dummy for this scene, and then I will be rendering a proper proper layer for it to compose in DAS and then compose it in Photoshop. So here we are. What I can do about all of these materials is temporarily to turn them off by using a clay mode in Octane. What this will enable me to do is just to focus on the main masses of the shop and how it's composed instead of thinking, oh, you know, I ha here have to worry about all of these guys here and this is not properly set up and this is too dark, this is the light. For now, I will be having just my camera and the elements and the masses that I want to compose around the sketch I created. So I'm trying to make it as simple as possible in uh, each step of the way, trying to have only one thing to do at a time so that I not getting distracted by you know shaders at this stage because this is not really important. What I want to do is take the sketch that I have and make it into a what I call a blockout, a 3D blockout that will help me cheaply iterate and find specifics in those super ugly brush strokes. Right, so I want to define. Oh, is that a car? Okay, which part of the car is it? I will use three D to do that now. All right, so let's get going. So right now you will see me combining all of those elements into a sketch that I will have underneath. It's a really quick time lapse of me just pulling out elements that I've gathered within that three D package and just trying to have the most important element in there first, which is my character. And I'm not going crazy with the specific spot that it has to be exactly since I still want to iterate on it. So I might rotate a little bit. I might um, 
push and pull since my sketch is really undefined. It does contain some information about certain masses, but as, uh, but as you can see, I can just get a car and it can be a back of the car and it can be a front of it. That certain dark mass in my sketch doesn't tell exactly what it is. Therefore, I'm sort of still creatively free to do whatever I want. So right now you, you can see me pulling those cars into roughly positions that I would like to take. And I'm not worrying about lighting or um, shaders or textures. This is all about matching the camera and using the elements I've gathered to build, uh, the, to build the scene that I planned for. And hopefully enhance it with all of the details I generated in the building stage. So yeah, still more cars. And you can get creative here with you know, the way they are crashing and you can add more with whatever you created just because there's way more detail within your, within your scene. So now I'm pre previewing, pushing and pulling, rotating, adjusting. And this is really a fun part for me since it, this is really bridging a gap between having this rough, undefined sketch and suddenly this thing starts to come to life and I can start noticing where the piece is going and I feel like I'm finally, you know, steering this um, production machine into the direction that I want to go for. You can see that like there is a shadow being casted on the character. I'm not worried about that. Again, this is just the place for the lighting for me. And what is really useful to think about when doing that is just that turn off all the shaders, no shaders, just white material. And you can do it in Octane by clicking this little sphere in the top in the Octane window. You can see that my shaders popped up for a sec and it just gets really messy and it's really hard to judge what is happening. So having just one value helps me a lot to, to focus on shapes and focus on the masses and not worry about the colors. So right now I'm trying to figure out the street and how it will sort of, where is the ground plane? in my scene. And I'm using some parts from the Kitbash set that I mentioned before from Photobash. Again, trying to match the sketch, but since it's, you know, it's a child's drawing at this point, I can, I can take into the consideration new shapes that I created with the shapes of the car and move those shapes behind which are buildings to sort of match and create mm, maybe even a better composition. Just switching the light. I like to play a little bit with that early just to see, you know, how the light reacts and whether there are some happy accidents happening. There might be some of that. So I'm just now trying to build my street into more into Z depth, more into Z space, right? So just trying to build it all the way back so that I have all of that detail in there since my character is central in the composition, a lot of convergence is happening in there. So I want to make sure there are enough, there is enough geometry and buildings to, for me to, to build that detail from. And you can be surprised like with how little kitbash sets you can get away with if you just rotate them, scale them, and push and pull them a little bit. It's really fun to, uh, to, to see how much variety you can get out of those kitbash sets. So now I'm almost ready with my 3D blockout. I might just 
play around with vignetting a bit and just like some post processing just to see how it how it stacks up. And once that is done, I might start an adjusting phase like I'm doing now. Just trying to find a you know, more cars on the horizon, I thought. Maybe it would be cool to see some cars in the background hitting the the road that I haven't planned for in my sketch. So here it is. My 3D blockout is done and we're ready to move on. Shading. So I just told you not to touch any shaders. I think that's the time to actually do that. It's not the most fun thing to do, at least uh, to me, uh, since um, I just have to scramble for a lot of materials from external sources. And I for that, I use um, LiveDB, uh, Live Material Database from Octane, which is great for all of these car shaders that you see me adding right now. So I'm aiming to create a couple of shader colors and different for different car variations so that I have this um, nice colorful look in my scene. So right now I'm just creating one of them and adjusting it so that um, looks believable. Adding some glass material to, the, the, to, to these things and then you can see me uh, applying those materials to all of the cars right now. So here the scale for the flakes didn't work. I have to adjust it. And, you know, this is just, you know, the moment in the art that I'm just popping music on and trying to get as much out of the 3D I created as possible, which is possible with nice materials and shaders. So it's an important step to me, a little boring, but what can you do, you know? Yeah. Um, sort of like coloring, a coloring book to me, um, how much you can actually extract from, from the shapes you have and how realistic the geometry will look once you apply all of those normal maps, displacements, colors, and shaders. Focusing on another car, trying to get rid of all of those black elements that you can see a lot of geometry there, but they just look black because probably like the glossiness is cranked way too low or the reflection, like the light isn't reacting with that material properly. So I need to take care of that. Again, scale of the, the flakes was wrong, so. Also trying to fix whatever textures I got with those cars. Sometimes just when you gather all of those elements from different sources, you tend to have different texture workflows for each of them. And some of those textures that just don't work properly and you have to improvise on those shaders. That's what I do at that stage. Again, I'm not worrying to make it look final. I just want it to be enough for me to know that I'll be able to overpaint that thing. So here we are. In contrast to the previous section, this stuff I really like. It's basically set dressing. We'll take the scene that we are building and we'll populate it with different flavors and elements and stuff that will just bring this scene to life, especially in this case, in this scenario where we will have a lot of stuff flying around and creating a lot of visual variation. Right now you can see me adding a street texture from Megascans, which I, I love, like, you know, and here I'm changing its resolution and displacement and I will use it as a foreground element. Therefore I'm using it in 8K just to have that maximum fidelity right here. Also creating a dummy camera and trying to foresee how the depth of field will look so that you know some of this pixelation in the foreground will get blurred and I will be able to get away with the texture that might look a bit pixelated. I'm also using a bit of Cinema 4D built-in assets, some 
poster signs and street signs, stuff like that. I'm just looking through them right now, whether I would like to add something, found some signs and some street lamps will come really useful. Again, browsing mega scans for some, um, for some assets that I could probably use in the scene. Here I found some like cool takeaway boxes that I thought, oh, okay, that's pretty nice. Maybe I could place some of them in the foreground and in the middle ground as if some sort of a trash can exploded or some car rammed into it. We'll also need some uh, rubble. So I'm adding all of those. And with mega scans, it's super easy. In that second, I just have all of those elements in my scene ready to go and re ready to render, basically. Just have to turn on and fix the displacement resolution. Really, really, really love that workflow. You can see me check the displacement density, whether it will be enough or not. Trying to simulate the destruction that this crashing car would cause to the concrete underneath it. You will see me repeating that pattern with uh, several more cars. Constantly rotating the light, not to look for the proper angle, but just to see how these elements react, react with it. Whether I set up the shader properly or did it import properly. Constantly switching between the camera view and my um, my just my plane view just to see you know oh where this could where this could go and right now I'm placing some additional takeaway boxes I'm not I don't want it to catch too much attention I'm just looking for a nice place for it to lay around to add variety so I don't want to destroy the composition I established in the the sketch that I made in the first chapter. And a turned over trash can hydrant. Some street lamps. At this point, I'm looking at some reference of a street and I'm just looking at things that, you know, make a street look like a street. There's a lot of different tiny prop that can make this scene come alive. So that's my intention here. Even more rubble, especially with those cars that are in the middle ground behind my character. This will be an element that will probably catch a lot of light. And this part, again, is really fun to me. It feels like set dressing, feels like you're building your own world and there's just infinite freedom that comes with it. Obviously, you have to deliver a pretty picture in the end, but... Mm, Sometimes I tend to get lost at that stage, just spent way too much time just having fun. So I have to slap my hands and say, oh, okay, you know, this is just one image. I have to focus on just getting this one image out. Stop sign. So again, it's red and it's pretty intrusive. So I need to make sure it's in the right spot so that it is visible, but it's not like screaming and i think i will end up probably rotating it around more takeaway boxes especially in the in the middle ground street level i want to make sure it's populated with elements and it's rich it's not like just a plain empty concrete it's trying to add a bunch of stuff so this scene becomes more and more complex at this point and i have to think about I, I don't care if it looks busy at this point. I have my sketch and I remember that if all of these details I'm adding are following the masses that I sketched out, it will be fine. So I'm trying to enrich the scene. I'm not trying to undermine my initial idea. So I want to stay creative and still keep iterating and adding to the illustration, but without undermining it so much so that it's a completely different idea from my very first sketch. 
here what's really cool i'm importing a lot of alpha DAO decals and if you add and crank up the displacement to those elements they can start adding like start acting like a flying debris which is awesome and right now i'm trying to populate my, my floor with a bit of that but then i rotated it and you can see it you can see it in the next to the red car flying around I'll, at this point i'll just start copying and pasting it all over just to have some flying stuff that is actually react, reacting with my 3d light also following that idea with some couple more assets like this trying to think of the way these cars would crash and which way the debris would go you can see it reacting to nice reacting to the light Also trying to keep my scene clean and name all of the groups and so that later on I can always find the stuff I need. Where I also found a, a bottle that I found it was like really cool looking. I decided to add it. Pro it will probably be flying around in the next second together with some other trash looking prop. And the quality of these assets, you know, it's really amazing. So I really love the way it's implemented here. It's saving me time. I don't, I don't have to worry about setting up those shaders and just worrying about the way it would be implemented into Octane. It's just one click and it's here. So you can see me adding that bottle. It reacts with the light so I can actually rotate it and nicely catches the light. So I'm almost done with this phase, which is just populating the middle ground with prop. Still looking for a couple of elements that I could use, just browsing through, and this actually gives me more ideas of what could I add or, yeah. So I keep turning off that city in the background just to see what I'm adding since my foreground will be separated from the middle ground with some haze. So in order to see that, I want to make sure it's fine. Just checking in on some passes and just notice that my character read, read is not really good because of the Z depth I turned on. I could clearly see its silhouette not working. So I shifted it so that it's, it's more forceful to the right. And I really like that direction. So now we are ready to move on to the next phase. Let's tackle lighting. All of the elements I needed for my scene are in there. Well, most of them, because I might still introduce some smoke and effects, but the most crucial elements are in there so that I can now focus on actually lighting the scene, looking at my sketch, and in this case, I am considering two lighting scenarios. One with the sun being behind my character and sort of backlighting the whole thing. And the second one is a side lit moment, sort of a top lit, back lit situation, middle of the day, you can see me now just trying to find a proper angle. I want my character to be rimlit from the back and the scene to be lit harshly, like a you know 1 p.m. type of lighting. And in this case, I'm I like the way the buildings and the street responds to my uh, to my lighting with that backlight, with that warm light. But I decided to go with this harsh 
lighting, daylight moment, just because it gets all of the nice colors out of my scene. And because there is so much light in there, I'm using light blockers, which are just pure, really simple planes, 3D planes that I'm just covering the light source a little bit, creating these shapes that I can use as a compositional element to either block the light or add a dark spot in my scene. You can see me now doing that for the foreground. I'm just trying to tone down the brightness of the light in the foreground. So this shadow can be casted from a car that is flying under over a camera, right? Or a building that is standing next to the camera. Um, I don't really care. It just implies that there is something off screen, which is another good thing because this feels like, oh, there is more to the scene beyond my camera constraints, my camera crop. So if the camera would move left or right, you could actually see more stuff. So this is all sort of subliminal uh, and implying stuff. So I'm just using these elements to create priorities within my scene using lighting. So this is really the only thing I'm doing here. Once I decided on the lighting and blocked the light that I don't need, I'm really ready to move on to the next phase. Remember the VDB volumes I talked about in the previous chapter? Well, right now we are going to use it to enhance our scene and populate it with a lot of juicy VFX kind of things, such as explosions, smoke, uh, so on and so forth. So I will be using them mainly to add some rest areas to my scene. So I will be using them as separators between objects. So you can see me now just grabbing it, scaling it, and putting in between objects so that I can either add some dynamics into the crash that I'm doing and I'm changing its opacity to sort of make stuff that's behind it a little bit visible. So it really acts like a visual separator for me in the first place. It's a really, it's an organic tool Smoke is it's an organic tool for me to um, go where, wherever I need and decrease the amount of detail and create rest areas and provide me with visual separation in the Z axis. So the further from the camera, the lighter it will get so that I can feel the depth of my scene. Trying to take care now of that each car has its own sort of smoke trail. So you can think of the way it's flying by just looking at this freeze frame. You can imagine it sort of rolling and flying through the air just by looking at that trail. Experimenting with some local fog here, just adding a little bit of dust on my ground plane. I was thinking of, of a girl just pushing off particles, but I decided not to do that. Once I have my smoke in, I'm trying to take care of the explosions. Adjusting shaders, just like I showed in the tutorial, in the intro to VDB, in the previous chapter. Right now, it's a good time to actually add those explosions in the moments that the cars are touching, hitting the ground, or exploding in the air. And, you know, it's super easy to go overboard with it. So since it's just a super saturated and visually intense element, you have to be careful not to overdo it wherever and whenever you use explosions with VD volumes uh, with the illustration. But to me, it, it really adds a lot of sort of color variety that I'm looking for. And I really like it and it will be enough for me 
to work on top of it. Since it's also lighting my scene, uh, all of these explosions are providing me with a little bit of emission light that is pretty saturated and it reacts with the objects around the scene, which is a nice touch and a nice flavor. And I really like it. It comes really cheap uh, to my scene since, and what I mean by cheap is that it doesn't compromise my performance, scene performance that is. With RTX on and with all of these cars, I can just go in and not worry about anything. Just keep copying those VDB volumes and I'm, I'm good to go. So this is due to my amazing NVIDIA performance. I'm almost having like a real time preview right here of the stuff that I'm doing, which is essential in the process of composing and defining, further defining my composition. adding even more subtle smoke and experimenting. As you can see, I'm going back and forth, back and forth, trying different things. I'm always trying to keep it fun for myself. So how can I make this illustration better? How can I make this read even clearer and more fun to look at? I'm always worried about that when, when creating a really fine illustration like this, which is just very detailed. Trying a big explosion in the foreground. I don't think that will work, so I will probably submerge that explosion a little bit into the car. So now it implies sort of even burning, not exploding, which I also like. And I will use that in the later stages of photo bashing as my indication of where I should put fire, smoke, or particles. The more I can get done in 3D to me, um, the better, especially in this sort of illustration that is really, really detailed and requires a lot of, you know, clean detail work. If I can have 3D to guide me through all of those undefined elements, I will certainly want to go there and use it to my advantage if I can. That's the reason for me to use VDB volumes right now to sort of look for that additional level of VFX that I could probably add in 2D. It would just not light my scene or the volumetric elements of it wouldn't be lit by the sun that I have in my scene. I keep using the same objects over and over, the same VDB objects, that is. I can just rotate them, scale them, stretch them, and they keep providing me with variety, even though it might be still the same, same VDB object over and over again. Just changing its density, changing its shader property can make it look a lot different. From you can you can be good with like just a couple of VDB volumes in your scene and trying to vary its size, shader properties might be enough for you to actually populate the whole scene with stuff like that. Especially when illustrating Mayhem, like here, having a lot of different types of smokes, different densities and different thickness of it certainly comes comes in handy. I'm also thinking of the directionality of my scene. So sort of making, making it so that all of the smoke trails are sort of pointing into my character. I want everything, every line in my scene to come back to that central character. And I will use smoke to do that. I will use um, car details. And as you can see, if you would probably use lines from the car, if you draw lines from the roofs of the car, these will probably point into the character. And that's that's really the explosive character that I'm going for of that illustration in the abstract. Trying to adjust shaders and 
seeing what type of thickness for the smoke would work best. Just turning it way up, seeing out, you know, maybe that's too much. The smoke is too thick. I cannot see what's behind my my smoke, which I still kind of want. I don't want to change the whole read of my scene at this point. This stage is just to enhance and make that illustration look a little bit more believable by adding rest areas with smoke, and some explosive elements, organic explosive elements for me to guide me at later stages. Here is my one last change that I want to introduce. Um, just changing the colors of the cars so that I decided that the top right car will be probably a taxi and the top left will remain blue. Just didn't really like the colors I came up with in the previous stage. So at this point, just looking for a couple of colors that would overall in my overview on that illustration would look rich, but not out of palette, which is hard in these types of illustration. But I want to look for a certain color harmony here. So I have blue, I have yellow, I have red, and I have green in sort of equal, equal amounts. I'm almost done here and ready to move on to the next phase, which will be checking out RTX. So let's move on. Before moving on to rendering the 3D scene I've created, I would like to talk about RTX accelerated cards. Uh, and these are RTX series. So these cards have a specific hardware that is its purpose is just to calculate ray trace uh, path tracing and this is all this is all it does and it speeds up my workflow tremendously as you know i'm using blender in combination with cycles which is a path trace renderer and a cinema 4d and octane which is also using ray tracing to render images so right now i would like to use the octane bench tool that Otoy provided me with to measure how much of a speed up it is. Um, and we'll find out what is the score as if I wouldn't have those RTX cores and then how much of a speed up it is when I have the RTX accelerated cards. So let's go and run a test. So here we are, uh, here are the results. And as you can see, the RTX off result is 915 OB. And the RTX on is 3142, which makes it three and a half times as fast, uh, which is just incredible. So in order to get that power, uh, I would have to basically have, what, 12, 2080 TIs, right? So just with the tick of a box, I can, um, within my 3D renderer, I can now uh, take advantage of these RTX cores, basically more or less tripling my rendering power without doing anything. So this is um, the way software developers are implementing and they start to use those RTX cores in order to actually speed things up um, with rendering and use those components for uh, ray trace rendering, which is incredible. So three and a half times as fast is just incredible and you can see it, it just varies right here it's 3.2 here it can go as fast as far as five times faster which is great you know i cannot imagine work, working on anything else these days so i really recommend rtx cards if you are into ray traced renders like octane or cycles now let's move on to rendering my scene so now in order to use those RTX cores within Cinema and Octane, I have to go into Octane settings and activate it in the settings, device settings, and here. Um, I'm using Octane 2020 RC1. It's still in the beta, but 
it actually lets you enable uh, RTX acceleration. So once that is clicked, I can use my RTX course and you will see that um, status in the lower right corner of the Octane render. So now we are ready to get into this scene and uh, render some actual passes that later uh, we'll paint over in Photoshop. So let's move on. So finally, I'm ready to render the scene. Uh, as you can see, we can get a quick view at how it looks like within the viewport. I separated the scene uh, into two scenes. So stuff that I will have in my foreground uh, and middle ground and stuff that I will have in my background, which is the city. So the city became a different scene completely now just for the sake of like quicker render so that I don't have to separate everything with with passes as I think still I might move some stuff so my scene is ready and now um, <clears throat> we can go through a couple of different uh, rendering modes that I will use so uh, so far I've used direct lighting here from the list and this is not an unbiased way to render it, it actually uses some sort of approximation to give me quicker results Although it still looks great, I think I will be uh, rendering in the path tracing mode. So if you now take a look at my render here, uh, let's try to create a uh, store and render buffer. And now turn on path tracing and let it render for a little while. It actually uses an unbiased render, which is not using an approximation, it's calculating all the rays as they are passing and reflecting from surfaces and stuff. And you will be able to see it now. Let's pause it. You can see how much reflected light this car gets with the, when path tracing is used, a lot of red which is nice. It just gets rid of that dark, dark shadow view. I'm ignoring the character for now because I will render it in iRay, in DAS. You see a lot of small changes that direct lighting introduces, um, which for, for my perspective, um, I would love to use path racing for, for this because of this reflected light and a lot of smaller things that I will be able to notice with my render uh, resolution increasing. So again, uh, my resolution for this will be double of what my final picture will be, which will be 4K, so 3840. This this is the width of the image that I'm planning to create as a final, the stuff that I will share online and I will be available. So what I tend to do is work in double of the resolution I'm planning to export. Finally, so that will be around 8K that I want to render out from, from here. The other thing are the render passes I will use. So if you would go now into info channels and let's turn off that render buffer. There are a couple of render passes that I will need with each of my renders to support uh, workflows used in Photoshop. For example, I'll need shading normals to sometimes use it um, when changing the direction of the light within Photoshop by separating channels, and I will cover that later. I will use Material ID to quickly separate objects and materials with uh, Magic Wand tool. I will use Ambient Occlusion with probably adjusting the distance a little bit, just to you know paint it in on multiplying a couple of areas that might look better. And I think that's it. Uh, these are only, ah, of course, Z-Depth. That's the one of the more important ones. It carries information about the depth of the scene. So I might even render this out in 16 bits to cover all of this spectrum that I might use to introduce some local fogging or just separating things and separating planes. So now that I'm ready to render, let's dive in and render the passes in 8K.
So right now we need to take care of rendering the character for that scene. And I will do that using Dust 3D and the pose that I've built before. So here's my little preview that I will use, a uh, preview render that I will use as a backdrop within Dust to pose and light my character exactly like in this preview. So in order to do that, I will um, now go into my project with my character and open up a panel called environment. And I will load the backdrop here and browse to my file location and choose my render preview. You can see now that it is pretty much stretched and contained within that box. So I need to change the proportions of my viewport. In order to do that, we need to go into render settings, general, and basically type in same resolution as here, which is 8003662. So in order to do that, I need to custom 8000. Three six six two, and now the proportions should be correct. Now we need to take care of the camera focal length. So let's navigate to cameras, create a new one, other camera, apply active viewport, copy active view, accept, switch to the camera, and right now we are operating the camera, we can adjust it. The problem is it's not tilted and it's not a proper focal length. So what we need to do is go back into cinema, take a look at our camera and its focal length, which is 36. So we can just plot that number in. So focal length will be 36. Now that setting is in, we can also rotate the camera by, I believe that is three degrees vertically. So in Z, rotate by three. Now we need to take care of the position of the camera and the size of my character. So this can get a little bit, this can get a little bit, you know, time consuming, but can somewhat nail it by just adjusting a few things around here. What I know for sure is that my character is pretty low to the ground. As you can see, I have rotated my character a little bit within Cinema 4D so that now the ground plane isn't really properly set up. So I need to fix that by rotating the character. So let's, let's try to make that ground working again and rotate the camera again by three degrees. And we need to rotate my character forward a little bit much. My horizon line is looking all right. I just need to rotate my whole character a little bit. So let's go to scene, grab a character, and try rotating. Oh. Should grab my parameters. There you go. Try rotating. 
some of these values. until it works. See, I'm slowly getting there. Takes a little bit of time. There are also a few things I would like to change with especially the hands of my character. I'd like them to be a little bit um, more tense and as if she's gripping those cars. So I would like her fingers to be way more claw-like. And that, I think, will correspond well with all of that sort of destruction of metals and tearing up uh, of the structure of it. So I will try to do that now. So I have somehow, I think, matched it enough with what I would like to see in the final and now let's try to set up the lighting so that it matches the sketch underneath and in order to do that i need to go into light add light new distant light accept and i will just rotate it so that it this rim light sort of resembles what i have within my sketch, which is guessing by this shadow is almost top down, a little bit to the back and to the right, I would say, and even more to the back. So this line is getting drawn here. And this light this intensity of this light is way too low so i'll add a couple of zeros here just to be able to see it save the scene and let's try to render this guy but before i do that i would i have to change my environment light to dome and scene so that it takes into the consideration the hdri plus the lighting from the custom scene light and right now it's set up properly Another thing is to turn off my camera headlamp. And now we are ready to turn the NVIDIA iRay on. And here we've got our preview. It looks pretty good. What I would like to do probably is to maybe make the light even more intense just to see how it looks couple of more zeros here in the lumen so it's basically over litting it right now and I can just take a look here if it's what I would like to have obviously it's too strong but maybe maybe it would be a little bit easier for me to judge its uh, direction by making it a little bit too strong so let's see how it looks like right now. And I think it should be a little bit more behind. Be like this. Yeah. And now let's see what light intensity I would like to get to here. Maybe let's get rid of one zero. I like this strong light coming on her but still too strong so maybe i'll just get rid of this five here and get the zero here still a bit too strong so maybe let's try to make it a half Yeah, so this looks pretty good to me. I have enough of the uh, highlights here. It's not getting overblown, but the definition of the highlight is, is all right. So now I can move into reposing my character a bit and making it a little bit more tense in the hands. So we are getting close to finalizing the assembly chapter. 
Now we'll be moving on to the compiling, which will just take all of the elements, take all of the renders that I've just prepared and bringing all of them into Photoshop. And now we'll be starting to work completely in 2D, which at this point is kind of a break free moment for me. So hope you enjoyed this chapter. Let's move on to the next one.